are Christianity and science perpetually at war with each other? Unfortunately, many people think that they are. It's a myth. But let's explore a few specific stories that are more small-scale myths that contribute to this larger myth. And as we look at these specific stories, ask yourself which parts of these stories are credible and which parts are unbelievable. Have you heard that people in the Middle Ages thought the Earth was flat? Uh, actually, they didn't believe that. You probably were taught that religion-induced ignorance made Europeans think that Earth was flat until 1492, when Columbus came around and showed it was round by actually sailing a long distance. Well, what were some of the arguments for a spherical Earth that were known before 1492? They included arguments like this one. Here is our planet. That little black dot is the North Pole, and here's the equator. Now, medieval students understood that if you were to stand on top of the North Pole and look directly overhead, you would see the North Star. But if you were to change your location to the equator of the Earth, you would have to look along the horizon to see that same star directly over the pole of the Earth. Well, it stands to reason that as you move from the equator to the pole, you would initially, at the equator, look right on your horizon to see the North Star, and then as you move closer and closer to the pole, eventually that star would be directly overhead. Well, medieval students understood this, and they realized that this implied that the Earth is round, not flat, or like a pizza, that wouldn't allow for this uh, gradual curvature in this sort of way. Medieval students were quite adept at arguing for things like this based on observations and then reasoning from those observations. Here's another argument for a spherical Earth that was well known through antiquity and through the Middle Ages. During a lunar eclipse, the edge of the shadow of the Earth cast on the moon is curved. Over about a quarter century of teaching science, including astronomy, I have sort of test, tested this out with my students, and as I compare my students' ability to argue for a spherical Earth with what the average medieval student knew, it turns out that if there were a debate between these now dead students and my living students, the dead students would win. Uh, that is, people in the Middle Ages who were, who were university educated typically had more uh, rational arguments based on observations for a spherical Earth than people on the planet today. So those Middle Ages weren't so dark after all, were they? And I mean, the myth is useful for making Christianity look stupid, but it just doesn't sync with history. Let's take another myth. Copernicus removed humans from a privileged center, and this was a huge blow to religious-based human significance. Christopher Hitchens, he called this opposition to Copernicus Christianity's greatest failure, the greatest failure of a world religion. And many people think that the church opposed Copernicus because they didn't want humanity to be demoted from this privileged cosmic center. One textbook communicates this myth in this way. Humankind has been torn from its throne at the center of of the cosmos. But when you look at the historical background, it turns out that the center was not actually the place of honor and privilege. The center was where generation and corruption occur. Up high in the heavens, that's the incorruptible world, according to ancient scientists. And that view, although it was criticized during the Middle Ages, it still was very a popular idea up until the time of Copernicus. So by removing Earth from the center, and now considering it as a planet, that was considered, or at least communicated as, a promotion for Earth by this first generation of Copernicans. I'll give you an example. Galileo, he once wrote, I will prove that the Earth does have motion and that it is not the sump where the universe's filth and ephemera collect. In the center is the place of generation and corruption. It's kind of like the trash bin of the universe. And Galileo is saying, I'm going to show you that the earth does move and it's not down there in the dishonorable place, but it's in a more honorable place. Kepler took this promotion even further. He wrote, we could not remain at rest in the center because of that contemplation, science, 
for which man was created, which includes measuring distances to planets like Venus. So once you consider Earth a planet that moves and Venus a planet that has a smaller orbit, if you draw a triangle out using some key observation points, using trigonometry, you can figure out how far Venus is from the Sun compared to how far Earth is. In fact, astronomers now call the Sun-Earth distance one astronomical unit, and you can find out what Venus distance is in terms of this astronomical unit. Kepler argued that a moving Earth viewpoint was more likely to be true because it's more likely that God created a universe and our place in the universe to make it easier to discover things, to, to make it easier to do science. Kepler had a theology that said, God made the world to make it intelligible and discoverable. And so a moving earth would allow scientists living on it to discover more than a stationary earth. Therefore, it's more likely that the earth moves. Science and theology were in harmony. Theology actually motivated an argument for the Copernican view. I think this is fascinating a theological motivation for a pro-Copernican argument. What about Copernicus himself? Well, he said, the cosmos was created for our sake. That doesn't sound like a demotion. So this demotion idea that Copernicus demoted Earth from a privileged place, it actually got embellished over the years and extended to try to make it fit with additional observations, such as the fact that we are not located in the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So one textbook puts it this way. Humankind has been relegated to an unremarkable position on the periphery of the Milky Way galaxy. In other words, making it sound like another Copernican demotion on another level, at the galactic level. The same textbooks that keep repeating this Copernican demotion myth and extend it to the galactic level also teach about the galactic habitable zone, which is the unique location within the galaxy that is life friendly. You can't be too close to the center of the galaxy or too far out in the periphery, or you will not have even the possibility of life. And what's curious is that sometimes the same textbook will say, oh, it's a demotion, we don't live in the center of the galaxy, but oh yeah, the galactic capital zone. So we are in a special zone that's life friendly. What I find really curious about this is how a historic myth about the relation between science and Christianity can actually distort contemporary astronomy. This is a prime example of that. The take-home lesson is, scientists can do bizarre things when they lose control of a familiar narrative. Neil deGrasse Tyson, a well-known science popularizer, writes what he calls the cosmic perspective. He says that this perspective includes the idea that the universe is not a benevolent cradle designed to nurture life, but a lonely, hazardous place. And the cosmic perspective opposes the childish view that the universe figuratively and literally revolves around us. Tyson goes on to extend this Copernican demotion, but he adds an additional twist to the story. He says the cosmic perspective is spiritual, even redemptive, but not religious. How so? Well, he seems to think that it redeems us from the delusion of design by showing that we're just evolved stardust. And yet, we're special. There's something spiritually significant about being human because we can do science. Well, even many non-religious people find this basis for specialness a little bit lacking. And so many people are wanting to fill this with something, well, a little more jazzed up. And there is a scientific looking story that helps them to do this. And this leads right into the final myth in my book, Unbelievable, which I call the extraterrestrial enlightenment myth. Let's go to a book published by NASA, Your Tax Dollars at Work. It explains in one essay by one particular author, there have been these Copernican demotions, we all know about that, but quote, perhaps it's time for a promotion. Well, what kind of promotion does he have in mind? He calls it cosmocultural evolution. And he claims that this undirected process can produce what he says is cosmically significant intelligence. Moreover, he says it might even have unlimited significance. Now, this is a myth in the anthropological sense. That is a story that is imaginative, archetypal, 
and it is worldview shaping. This is the most remarkable trade-in offer in the history of popular science writing. Here's the deal. We can give up this Copernican demotion, and in exchange, we get a massive promotion, ET enlightenment, when we receive the wisdom of the accumulated years, billions of years, of cosmocultural evolution. And so it's kind of like we can sit at the feet, or lower appendages, of ET and just soak up these billions of years of wisdom. That is a very inspiring story for many people. Skeptic Michael Shermer, along the lines of this story, writes, any sufficiently advanced extraterrestrial intelligence is indistinguishable from God. Richard Dawkins says almost exactly the same thing. The idea is that if ET were to show up on Earth, because of the vast distances of space, it would have had to have created a, such advanced technology that that technology would be indistinguishable from magic. So what do we have here? A godless materialist story that anticipates the arrival of a godlike ET. How ironic. So in conclusion, what can we learn about just the three myths that we've talked about? About the Christians in the Middle Ages thought the earth was flat, and the Copernican demotion, and this ET enlightenment myth. There's two main things we can learn from these myths. First, there is a false idea circulating out there that science grows only when guided by godless thinking. And yet, secondly, ironically, this misguided godless thinking, atheism, has led to the expectation of a godlike ET that will contact us and radically revise spirituality and religion on earth. My book, Unbelievable, not only debunks myths like these, but it also shows that Christianity has had a positive role in the rise of modern science, and that's worth remembering.